I so I should say Paul is recording. That's it. Yeah. So there's my competency okay. shot, and um, John will send me a certificate for Skype competency. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's been such a long day. Right, anyway, and five. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another E5 podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Paul Meenan, and today I have the usual suspects with me and another co-host. Can you introduce yourself, lads? Hello, I'm JW. The man, Hi. Myth, the legend. Hello, it's, it's David Sparking Ninja here. I swear you're just, you're probably just downstairs. You're just, oh, just constantly with me all the time. Thank you for being here, Dave. We yeah. have a guest today or a co-host, whatever we want to call them. Um, could you introduce yourself, please, sir? Yep, my name's Robin, and I'm from Dane. D- D- Dane. D- Dane. Dane. Right, so yeah. there's my first question. <laughs> um, uh, Dane, not Den. Right, okay. I'd, I'd always pronounced it Den. That's okay. Um, it's Dane. But we answer the both. I've been called worse as well. Okay, fair, fair enough. Um, <laughs> would you like to tell us what, what Dane actually do? Uh, well, it, it, it's um, a manufacturer, a German manufacturer, family-run business. It does surge protection, lightning protection, and, and earthing. And that's pretty much it. We don't do breakers or anything else. We're a very niche company in over-voltage surge protection. I'm not going to do my German impression as much as I'm tempted to, because I'll probably get torn to pieces by JW in disappointment. Um, okay, so Dane, you're a German company, and you specialise in lightning protection, surge protection, and earthing. Awesome. Right. Well, that's cleared that up. So we have a manufacturer on board just for everyone listening. We are not sponsored by them whatsoever. So calm down and don't panic. We are going to continue the topical conversation of surge protection within the electrical industry, because to a lot of electricians, it's this new electricery. It's this new invisible thing that we don't really understand. Some people hear the word surge. They hear the word transients and they think, you know, is there a homeless person in my PVC cable? (laughs) No, there isn't. It's these weird electrons that occasionally spike now and again. Um, we're going to get straight into the debate. And the first thing I would like to talk to you about, sir, if mm-hmm. if you don't mind, is in 7671, in our uh, wonderful model forms section, um, we don't really have that much to do when it comes to surge protection. What, what are your what are your views? <laughs> you think this could be better. It could be a lot better. Um Really, all you've got is a single tick box. Is the SPD present and is it working? That's pretty much it. Um, Now, that might be fine for a domestic dwelling where there may only be one SPD. But when you get into, say, something a bit larger, like a retail unit or commercial or data center or whatever, that one tick box isn't going to cover it because you really need to know about the um, installation for every single SPD. Um, we have in the regs the SPDA, Surge Protection Device Assembly, and we're told quite quick, clearly about the overcurrent protection, the length of cable, and the size of cable. So, does every SPD within an installation tick the boxes for an SPDA? Because if the cables are too long and there isn't another SPD downstream, that's a problem. If I've got a type one device rated at 25 KO per pole and it's being fed by a little breaker, that's a bit of a problem. And if it's being connected up with a bit of wet string, that's also a bit of a problem. So every location for an SPD, I think, uh, requires a major change to the model forms. Just as we have a consumer unit, you know what the breaker is, what type of breaker, and all of these other factors about overcurrent protection, but we don't have anything similar for over voltage. I, I can't disagree with any of that. <laughs> why, why do you think this is? Um, because it's still comparatively new, and I'm not sure that um, the, 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 the forms themselves have really caught up with um, practice. Yeah. That sounds that sounds that sounds acceptable. Yeah, I, I would actually say what he said to me. My brain is saying that effectively what we're doing is verifying and validating that the selection and erection of the SPDs is in line with 
manufacturer's instructions and good installation practices. There's nothing on the model form that allows us to record and validate that we've either done that or even on an EICR that it's compliant. So how do we know that we're affording the correct level of protection to the installation? Do you know what? I'm bombshell. Hello. <laughs> why didn't we? Why did? Oh, yeah, I'm blown away. Yes. No, I totally agree. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've been to installations, uh, one of which, if it failed, we would all know about it. I, I can't obviously mention what mm, it is. No need to. Yeah. And this was built in the 80s. The switch gear is very much 80s in its style and appearance. And there was a little window in this piece of switch gear and you can clearly see that there's a surge device and beside it there's a breaker and i just thought there's something not quite right about this can we actually open the door of this compartment so we open the door that device has been installed since 1980s and it still hadn't actually been hooked up to any electricity there was no connection cables whatsoever it was just an spd in a compartment so mm. i'm thinking it's been there all that time and nobody's noticed how can that possibly be the case and if you go to like a place where there might be a like a row of leds on an spd and i went to a financial institution one of the leds has gone out and i said to the guy i was with how long has that light been out i don't know don't even know what it is so without it being more prominent on the forms and all the other associated paperwork, that will still carry on unless the forms are changed to reflect the changes in the 18th. We're going to stay in this sort of really um, dodgy position, to be honest. I, I don't disagree, actually, if, if you don't mind me saying so. I've, mm -hmm. I've actually recently had the exact same problem on a railway station. Mm -hmm. So on one of my railway stations, we have a, a 1980s style panel um and there's a glass window and you can see in it uh, a surge protection device and a breaker next to it and one of the guys because we were talking surge 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 um he went and looked and opened it up and went oh um you're not gonna believe this but <laughs> there's this surge protection device that's never actually ever been wired up yeah yeah never been yeah. wired up bonkers isn't it it's the trouble is is if people don't know that they don't know this stuff and they've got no access to the resources or the knowledge mm. and our industry is well known dave as you know without delving deeply into training in um, industry we are uh, fed breadcrumbs of knowledge as a, as yeah. a trade would it be fair to say we're we're we're, we're told what they well, think we need to know without yeah without without going deep 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 into training obviously i've delivered the 2391 for a number of years now and Take things like SPDs and take things like power factor correction. These are what we would call bubble niches, hmm. which when it comes to then training somebody, we were then just pushed to the side and we wouldn't have the resource or the time to actually stress on the need for an inspector to identify root cause analysis and actually identify how SPD should be correctly coordinated, selected, how power factor correction should be properly inspected and checked. And what ends up happening is it becomes outside of the training and then in, in their mind just becomes habit as a limitation or a little consideration. Mm. And so you have this you have this device that's so you know heavily relied upon, but it's outside of their normal scope, their normal work, and they just maintain the habit of of passing it by. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's I think that's the case with many of these devices. Mm -hmm. It's um, also the appetite as well of the clients and the employers to pay for said what you would consider niche training. But we now need to understand mm -hmm. is is to me now, I think it's fairly evident from past surge protection podcasts. It's business as usual. Surge protection yeah. now for electricians is business as usual, regardless of your domestic commercial industrial. But it's the applied knowledge which is mm. still the quest that people are on. It, How do it, they apply that? It, need, it, needs to, it needs to evolve. The train needs to evolve. It's the same. I mean, we're talking a lot now about electrodes, obviously. But, you know, for the past 10 or so years, the electrode testing part of 2391 would be mentioned but not performed. And the practical assessment doesn't perform it. Mm, mm. it would be a couple of slides with the different types of test method and then that will be it the worst i mean the, the probably the biggest thing you'd have to do is know how to draw and describe the test for your assessment but then you don't perform it mm. and so you know these little things fall out of the cracks of training what, is this in the 2391 yeah i had to do it i had to do an earth electro test on my 2391 i'm showing my age now shut up sorry okay <laughs> Uh, right, the, we actually the, had a place the, where we could 
do the yeah. electro testing outside. Yeah, the no, other no. thing you've got, though, is in a few years' time, when all of these new SPDs will come for their first inspection, mm -hmm. so the forms are going to be difficult. And secondly, let's imagine that a Sparks turns up to a place that he did a few years ago and the SPD has gone out or an installation suffers damage, but there had been an SPD fitted. The first question anyone's going to ask is, well, when, when was the last time you even looked at it? Mm. Yeah, because if you haven't looked at it, you're never going to know when that popped. And that's when this constant <clears throat> monitoring facility which you can have will mm. become more and more important so is maybe the the requirement for status indication just not actually being applied as, as it's written in the regs is that well, just um well every spd needs to have the facility to report whether it's okay or not mm. now the spd is going to be in a metal box with a metal lid so you can't see it mm -hmm. We can't even get people to hit the test button on an RCD. So we stand no chance telling people to have a look at the SPD every time there's been, say, a summer storm or something. That's just not going to happen. But if you automated the process, say, with a, a remote uh, vault-free changeover contact, um, mm -hmm. that takes the climbing under the cupboard under the stairs sort of scenario out the way. And it gives you a, I don't know, a flashing red light on your mantelpiece to worry about. Ooh, what's all that about then? And then you sort of make it a little bit more, I don't know, proactive. We've even suggested that having a small LED indicator on the outside of the consume unit where something has gone um, would then just continually flash wide into a, a small relay on the output of a surge detection device would be would be beneficial in, in some way. Me and you have spoke about it many a times, Dave. Mm. Some sort of visual indicator that's not just a a flag that goes black or red or green, but mm. an actual light that will use energy and just pulse to make people aware. Uh, like with arc fault detection devices, them them devices, they do well, flash. Well, you brought up AFDDs. Now, I mean, as, 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 jo as, as, John, <laughs> as John noticed with his, you know, they come with a variety of different instructions with smiley faces and unhappy faces and mm -hmm. color indicators. And we have to give clients this information on what to do if it's this pattern or that pattern. Um, you know, so those devices have gone down the, the the avenue of, you know, the installers educating the clients on device behavior. Mm. But I think for, I think in history, that's never been the case. We put that blooming sticker for our CDs and assumed that covers us. And the SPD indication is just, as you say, it's been self-contained. The clients haven't been uh, educated on the necessity to actually verify the device. Mm. So we need automation or some way to force the clients to take attention. So when the devices do require assistance or urgency. John, is there a sticker, or, or, or Rob, is there a sticker that comes with SPD devices that says, dear um, end user or maintainer, can you please check for this? Can you uh, undertake these visual inspections, please? Yeah, yeah, well, I mean, as a manufacturer in all of the products which are um, sort of mains voltage, there's going to be a red sticker for, for our um, purposes little red sticker with you know this installation has spds and need to be checked time and uh, now and again or it's uh, the the additional line is this um installation has spds please remove them before you do your ir test mm. if you're gonna sort of zap an installation with 500 volts it's gonna look at it and think oh i better turn on and you're gonna get a mad result on your meter and tear the place apart but the problem was basically not isolating or unplugging the spd um, I mean, you're not going to damage the SPD, but um, you're going to have an erroneous um, reading. So it is important to label the presence of SPDs. But there isn't any real guidance mm. in 7671 for the inspection regime. I don't, is, there's, nothing in, there's nothing in 514 either, is there, for labeling no, those? I'm looking now at 514. And I can see the installation, uh, the RCD label, the bonding, the periodics, the dual colours. I can't see anything for a surge protection. Do you know what? Again, I mean, this one's, there are so many people going to be listening to this going, oh, seriously, another label, another label to go on a board. I'm sorry to say this, but again, this is my personal view. The front of consumer unit doesn't have to be a pretty picture. It needs to be fit and functional and uh, I've always been of the view that any electrician who should walk up to a consumer unit or a distribution board should be able to read the label on it and go, okay, 
I know where I'm going with this. I know exactly what the hazards are. I know I used to have the old rule of thumb. There used to be eight labels to a consumer unit, um, you know, designation where it's fed from voltage, periodic, RCD, dual label, um, dual colors, high protective conduct currents, voltage um, equipment, sensitive to test voltages, all that good stuff. Um, because you knew if somebody put the right level of labeling on it, it means somebody put the right amount of attention to detail into it. Mm. Mm-hmm. And I've seen so many boards where there'd be one label, 400 volt, and you'd be like, wow, what do you do? Open it up, RCBOs in there, um, high protective conductor current circuits, IT equipment, you know, surge protection connected. And you're just thinking, no one's no one's informing the local guy who may not have access to the records, the information, the instruction, the, the necessary stuff he needs to do his job safely. It just doesn't exist. And this is why I've always said, and I say this in many an employer, you may have all the processes in the world, but when the engineer is out on site, it's the local labeling and the records that are there nearest to the bit of kit that he's going to treat as his single source of truth. Mm-hmm. This is why I'm I'm an absolute nightmare for um, snagging and labeling and all the rest of it. And that's why I've always said 7671 is a minimum standard for labeling. And if you're struggling to meet that, you have got major problems because that is definitely one section we should be working from to increase the level of knowledge for the future electrician working on it. Just yeah, a view. To, uh, back to this thing about the uh, whether it's failed or not, and certainly in domestic, this is going to be a major problem because people are already fitting surge protection devices, and in a lot of cases, they're buying a consumer unit with one already in it as part of it, mm-hmm. putting it in somebody's house. And uh, like you said earlier there, they can't even check the RCD works every six months or whatever. So if that actually fails or if it's got one with an external breaker and it just gets turned off, who is actually going to notice this? And it could just sit there for years or even decades. Nobody's going to notice. So even if it's put in there and it's wired in, it might not actually be uh, doing the proper thing. Absolutely. I fully agree. And I've been to installations where the SPD circuit's been turned off. Everything still works wonderfully, but you don't have any protection when that first surge comes along. That's your lot. You know, it's going to do exactly what it wants to do. Mm, And the the only guidance, yeah, the only guidance actually is from BSEN 62305. That's the lightning standard. And there is a section in there on ongoing inspection of the physical protection, which is done on a rolling annual basis. And then that's when you would actually have a look at the SPDs as part of the overall lightning protection and the surge protection measures, which are part of 62305. <clears throat> but that's not in 7671. And I think in future, there'll have to be some guidance about how often, uh, maybe a bit more clarity about having some remote indication. Purely from the practical point of view, nobody's going to ever look at this thing. Yeah, I don't disagree. I mean, John, you were saying about RCD labels. We know that there are RCD. We know there are RCBOs out there that, that have test monthly labels, three monthly, six monthly. The ABB stuff is every 12 months. So you've got a different variety straight away. People are still sticking in whatever the minimum requirement is in the regs. They're not thinking about their labeling systems. Um, well, I think one of the biggest problems is, Robin, is, is Sparks are very much taught, especially now, if you go to even the Alexis, they are specifically told um, 62305 is your line of protection system, 7671 is then your surge. This is what you need to consider. Stay within the boundaries of the blue book. That's all you're required to do. Um, mm. If you're going into 62305, then it's specialist subcontractors, etc. But I, well, I could tell you a million stories of the misery I've had with lightning protection installers doing brand new LPS systems, leaving a coil of cable in a switch room and going, you need an NIC contractor to do the rest of it. Yeah. And I go, do what? Oh, you've got to fit a surge protection. Great. Was that in your costing? No. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Where's my certificate? Oh, we'll give us a ring when they're finished. I've had that loads yeah. of times. Yes, absolutely. I'm absolutely with you on that. And, and one of the other things about the 18th edition and surge protection is the requirement for different trades to communicate better. Now, if you think about a more commercial one, like one of your stations, uh, when you have lightning protection, you you can have a choice of two types. You can have everything cross-bonded together, or you can have an isolated system using masts so your plant on the roof isn't directly hit by lightning. And this brings me on to something else we might talk on uh, a bit later, but if you've got plant on the roof and it's bonded to the 
the SPD is on the roof line because you have to address the cables coming from the outside in, or will have to be type one. Yet if you have an isolated system, they can be type two. So there's a lot of validity and purpose in having a conversation with the LPS guys because you're all actually working on the same thing. And that's the protection of the installation. And that conversation just isn't happening. And to throw another spanner in the world. Yeah, you're right, actually. It's, it's not. I and, tell you, you now, know, it isn't. Just, just, a, just a dwelling. You know, you, you've got a guy, it's done the wiring, and then another guy comes up in a different colour van, and he puts an aerial on the roof or a sky dish. And that, under the regs, is another conductive cable coming from the outside in. Who's going to take responsibility for the SPD on the aerial line coming in? That's true. And also, you may not be aware that in the BT master socket, there used to be a little gas tube just to deal with low level sort of surges coming down the line. Now, that's been taken out that component for several years now because it's believed that it would throttle the bandwidth of the faster speeds that we're demanding. Um, so you actually, if you're like me, I've got an overhead BT line and there isn't now any SPD in the master socket so the surge on the overhead line can come straight into my dwelling and as i have had happened it took out the master socket the little plug-in microfilter and my router so i can speak from personal experience about that so you can't can you actually sign off a dwelling unless you've covered all the cables coming from the outside in or those going off down the garden to a workshop or something because they all have to be considered okay these, these, a, these, these, all these areas go outside of the common electrician uh, bubble, mm. you know, because this is the thing we, you, you, you said a minute, Paul, we try to keep lighting protection guys over there. We try to keep electrical guys over here. But if we don't understand how spheres of influence work, we don't understand how the Faraday cage effect and cables coming in through that work. We need to identify those so we can see where transients can come into the system, well, like the BT cable you've just mentioned. Electricians need to understand that. This mm. was the biggest shocker when we were doing the um, the talks at the recent Alex this year, when we were discussing the need for you know the external third party services to have some form of surge protection. The the electricians were dumbfounded. They were shocked. They were like, ah. How do we do that? Which leads me on to a question for you, Robin. Mm -hmm. um, is there not? So I have uh, a DNO supply cable. It comes in and the DNO is a minimum. They have a, a fuse. Is mm -hmm. there no requirement at all? Because I, I, I don't have BT. Their, their cable disappeared off the side of my house. Um, but I do have Virgin um, coming in underneath the ground. Do they not have any duty of care at all to ensure there's, there's some sort of um, surge protection in their distribution or, or at the point of no. entry to my house? I mean, the DNO, right. even though you know, we have this requirement in the regs, the, the DNOs are not covered by 7671, are they really? No, they're not, not at all. So there's no obligation there at all. And as far as BT is concerned, their responsibility stops on the inside of the master socket. And all I, right. as a consumer, cannot fit anything on the back side of the master socket because that isn't my responsibility. I could only ever plug the SPD into the front of the master socket. So the master socket is actually really considered as a sacrificial part. So if I lose my service because there is a lightning strike, and as I say, I've had this personally, I'll be offline until the engineer comes around and fixes it. And that's just the way it is. I mean, I, I also had a conversation with Sky once this is going back a few years, and I said to Sky, you know, this is a huge opportunity. You know, you could sell SPDs, you know, because that would like protect the box and protect the TV and all the rest of it. And the answer was, why on earth would we do that? We've got Sky Protect, and we can sell that to you for nine ninety nine a month, and that's an insurance policy just for these sorts of things. So they would obviously make far more money at nine ninety nine a month than supplying you with a little gadget which would stop the problem and possibly stop a fire or other peripheral damage in your installation. This is a bit where I normally swear and use the M word with the <laughs> F word. Um, oh, it just boils it, doesn't it? It just It's frustrating as hell, yeah. Someone in marketing has seen uh, that there's a commercial, yeah. See, I think these people do have a duty. If they're, if they're piping in copper cables or conductive cables into your building, then there must be some duty of care on them. It's interesting. It, 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 it's bizarre. I mean, when I first got started in this, I, um, 
on my first training course, I met an American lawyer, believe it or not. This is not going to be a long story. Uh, where he res represents people that's had problems with lightning. And there was this guy who had absolutely no money. He phoned up the telephone company and says, I want you to disconnect me. I can't pay the bill. Now, in America, they're mostly made of wood, these houses, and the cable was coming from an overhead line. So the phone company said, I've disconnected you. In the next storm, lightning hit the overhead line, got to his house, burnt it down. And the solicitor for the American lawyer successfully sued the phone company because they had not properly disconnected him from the phone line oh so does that reversing that does that suggest that if we connect ourselves to a phone line we are accepting a level of risk yes you as got, consumers you are because if the phone line wasn't there um lightning couldn't hit it could it mm. that's interesting well, I'm thinking about this ever so slightly different. <laughs> um, well, no, I'm just thinking now that it's going to be a very interesting chat with Virgin Media over the next couple of weeks while we're all sat at home asking to speak to their technical department saying, right, what do we need to do here? It's there must be some kind of single regulator that kind of governs some requirement for all these utility companies to bring their infrastructure into a dwelling environment or something. Is there not? Isn't that Ofcom, perhaps? Is it? There must be something. It's more a complaints body, though, isn't it? Well, you can complain that your house has burnt down, surely. Uh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Mind you, if it's, if it's fibre, you've got absolutely no problem. So no. if you had high-speed fibre, people ask us all the time, do you do something for fibre? Well, we'd love to sell them a box with a little bit of fibre in there, but no, that's not necessary. Yeah. Only if it's conductive copper. Yeah. yeah. It's the strange thing about being a bit of glass in a cable, isn't it? Um Funnily enough, they're actually installing fibre in my area. I've been tempted to take them up on it, although I'm 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 at a protest going to be ditching Virgin Media because I pay fifty two pound a month, and yet I can go online and get the same deal for twenty four pound a month. There's loyalty for you, eh? Over That's the loyalty years. these companies offers to their existing customers. It's the best in the world. It's disgraceful. Yeah. Um, sorry, <clears throat> did I mention they were Virgin Media? Yeah, I did. Okay. <laughs> yeah, one unhappy customer. Okay, so. Um, Wow, fair enough. Um, next question. Um, before I jump in, John, have you got any thoughts, feelings, emotions you'd like to? Yeah, I mean, this thing is certainly even a sort of even in a well, domestic as well, but certainly even any other installation. I mean, is it going to get to the point where the electrician that goes to do a like a full rewire is going to have to consider all of these other things coming in the building, whether or not they actually put them in? Because if they go and said, Yeah, I've just rewired your house and it's cost you like 10,000 quid. And you put a surge protection in on the, say, the main supply, but you didn't put one on the TV aerial and you didn't put one on the sky dish and you didn't put one on the phone line coming in. Could they then be on the hook for all the damage that was caused if it subsequently uh, struck that? So is that something that people are going to have to consider in the future? It, it, it's a very interesting one. I've been involved with some um, very large dwellings, multi-million pound installations, and there's been surge protection on the low voltage supply. So that's fine. That's great. And then there would be a guy from the TV um, company putting a dish on the roof. Now, the organization there is the CAI. And that organization representing the aerial installers does have a BSEN. I think off the top of my head, it's 60678, um, something like that. And that comes from the same hymn sheet as 7671. You need surge protection, type one if there's lightning protection, bonded to the aerial, type two otherwise. So there is a similar theme between the two trades. And I've been to these places where you don't just have um, a cable going out to different locations for the power, but also networking. And quite often we get a surge hits the ground. And if there's a networking cable going off between sub buildings, then the uh, networking infrastructure the switches are taken down, the internet cameras are taken down, all of that sort of stuff. And there is a group of standards about surge protection on networks, but are those installers now compromising the entire installation because they haven't filled the holes in their Faraday cage? Mm. Crikey. Well, this is bombshell after bombshell, isn't it? So at the moment, we're going hell for leather installing surge protection in, in domestic consumer units, type twos in everywhere, but we're missing all the type threes potentially. But more importantly, 
we are missing the potential duty to cooperate and coordinate with the other utility providers. Yeah. Um, do now, so that that leads to the question of: Is there any information out there from uh, industry manufacturers or industry bodies to help electricians engaging with the? Because if I let's say okay, let's say Robin, I come around to your house, mm-hmm. and I am going to put in. So I'm going to change a board, and I realise, oh, okay, well, I'm going to put this type two in. Now let's pretend you don't work for Dane. <laughs> um, and you're just a lame consumer. Um, and I turn around and I said, well, I think you've got a BT, you've got, a, you know, a copper line. I, I'd like to put some surge protection on it. Um, and you go, oh, well, yeah, OK, you'll have to speak to BT. That then immediately brings in GDPR and and the, and the, the, the authority to talk to, because every time where I am at work now, this has only come in since GDPR, but every single designer and electrical contractor or electrician that wants to speak to the DNO or anything to do with power supplies, I need to give them a written letter of authority under GDPR that they can actually pick up the phone and talk. Will that be the same in the domestic home? Because just just look at the complexity this could bring up. You try and do a consumer unit change. You go for best industry practice, provide type two. You then recommend that there is type three, but the volume of work and interface to engage with um, the likes of BT, is there any information out there for the electricians to be able to engage? Because let's be honest about it, BT, I'm using them as an example, mm. should almost have a pro forma going, oh yeah, okay, well the wiring rigs changed, so we're, we'll, we should be expecting a, a raft of people saying, I now want to start installing type three on my side of the consumer's installation. Uh, you don't need to get in touch with BT though, do you? If it's in your part of the installation, you can have the Type 2 in the consumer unit. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, here, I do have a Type 2 in the consumer unit. I have an overhead BT line, yep. and I have one of those sockets which has got two outlets in the front, one for voice, one for data. And because I can get a, a nice free sample, I have two SPDs, I kid you not, one for voice, one to data, very close to where that um, socket is because, well, it's a component under test, isn't it? And then where I've got, um, say, where my TV is, I've got a trailing socket with built-in surge protection as well. And that needs to be a very good quality one. You don't want to go for one which has just got one knee and indicator. So you can't have electricians fit in the SPD in the consumer units and say, I've done your house. So I'm just looking at pictures of the Type 3 devices. I've just Googled some. And yeah, I can see what you mean now. The um, the 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 connection is effectively you just it's a male and female plug, isn't it? You plug Absolutely. it in in series. Yeah. Um, the coax ones are a bit more fickle because they looks like they've got a uh, separate earth connection that you need to earth yeah. to. That's and not that, going to look very pretty. No, it's not. I mean, I do have one, and uh, for my TV aerial, and it's hidden behind the back of the telly. Um, it's uh, an inline connection. And I just need a little bit of earth cable, no more than, say, 300, 400 mil max, a little bit of 2.5 green and yellow into the back of the socket. And that's it. I've given the surge that path to get into the um, CPC and just dissipate the energy to earth. I mean, it's not going to be a huge amount of energy because the coax is tiny. It's only going to transmit a surge of 100 amps or so, something like that. Yeah. Oh, that's good. That's good to know. Um, that then leads me on to my next subject. Mm-hmm. Um, this, to a lot of people listening, and to me, <laughs> um, surge protection is fairly evident from what we spoke earlier on with the the ongoing need for the model forms to be far better. Because if I could just, before I go into my next bit, one of the things I found, I don't know about you, Dave and John, when, when I did my 2391 inspection and testing, I found one of the ways I validated my knowledge was by using the model form. And, and in the good old days, they didn't have all the reg numbers and as a robust a tick sheet, you had to go away and read the reg or create your own crib sheet and understanding of the inspection schedule. Now it's pretty much laid out for you. Um, but it was a great way of validating and verifying your knowledge. Um, in that respect, we are... To this day, and I can openly admit it, the amount of arguments I have on jobs uh, for building services design compliance, and it's always emergency lighting. These are the, the very arse end of the jobs. Emergency lighting is always the one of, oh, do we have to do it? Do we have the budget? Uh, lightning protection, which is just um, nobody tell the wizards. 
and then we don't have to pay for it and surge protection what's that that's generally so how do how do you think we need to better integrate it into um, building design so it becomes business as usual the norm in the hearts and minds of people what do you think we can do better there um I'm on a couple of projects at the moment, and one of the things that we decided from the onset, that, that, that fortunately for Dane, we get involved very early on on a project, um, certainly for the earthing and the lightning protection. Somebody needs to take responsibility, and by that I mean they make a site-wide decision what the surge protection will be, because you have packages. You have the LV package, and the surge protection will be um, from the same manufacturer for coordination purposes from the main distribution board to the end equipment. And another package is the like the chillers and the air handling units on the roof. That's supplied by another group. But the common bit is going to be like the surge protection. It needs to be coordinated with the SPD and the LV supply feeding that equipment. And then there may be other packages for say who's putting together the data center in this office block. So you, you need to make a decision and right into the specification, all SPDs shall be lovely to be Dane, but they all need to be of a common type. It's like when you have over current protection, you have to have some sort of selectivity or discrimination is the old word. Mm -hmm. And you will need that decision to be made site wide for all the packages and all the services really for a much larger installation. So on the controls, on the coaxes, on the ethernets, on the emergency lighting package, on all of that sort of stuff. That needs to be made very early on that a site-wide decision for the surge protection needs to be undertaken. And then a lot of the problems will just disappear. Do you know what it sounds like to me? I hate to say this. It sounds like there almost needs to be a guide for building services engineers written that tells them these you know some of these common rules of you know make sure you don't mix and match surge protection mm -hmm. devices as a common framework rule make sure that when you are uh, designing them you are considering the lengths of the cpc the sizes of the cpc the position within the fixed <clears throat> installation yep. which in, in in all fairness i have seen some recently installed surge protection which the minute i looked at it i just went well, that's way too long uh, those cable lengths are way too long. And I asked the electrician, why'd you put it there? And they go, well, it was out of the way. <laughs> yeah. But they don't know. They don't know that they don't know. And it was like, great. So then I had to say to him, look, you know, as close to the origin as possible, as short as possible. Um, and when we went through it, they understood it. But it was like, oh, now I need to reset out how my switch rooms are. Now I need to rethink and reevaluate. Yeah. Is there any guidance that building designers can use or electricians can use now? Um, well, uh, the, the thing is, seven six seven one. I mean, I'm, I'm very familiar with it, obviously, but there is very clear guidance on the surge protection device assembly, and that is the CPC, uh, uh, the uh, cable size, cable length, and the OCPDs. Um, so long as you specify those particular reg numbers, would, would would that be the way to go for? Because that really does hone it down, doesn't it? So, yes, I, I agree with you in, in the context of what you're saying. Yes, it is in 7671. So I'll, I'll put it into the context of I am working on a job where I am using, let's say, I don't know, WS Atkins. Well, they don't exist anymore, but let's just say I'm using Atkins to yeah. do a design for a 50 million pound railway station. That I can tell you now, 20 years experience, the m and &E architect um, designer will barely ever read the wine regulations book. He won't. He will do a half day CPD course and some key changes and then just hopefully try and attain some CPD from a manufacturer. And that's it because he's too damn busy. And this is where lots and lots of stuff gets lost in the ether. And then I come along as a client and I go, right, please present to me your building services design and he'll wing it. And then I'll sit in the room and this is this has happened to me where I'll stop him and I'll tell him more about the products than he knows. Yeah. And I'm sitting there going. Why am I paying? Oh, God. And, and this, this is why I'm saying it would be it'd be really good to have a common framework manual or guidance note that can be delivered for building services designers. Not, I'm not talking now in the domestic, by the way, for those. Listening. Oh, that's fine. This no. is the commercial industrial application yeah. and how all of these systems interact and coordinate 
a lot better. I just think, I think we're missing the trick. Yeah, we, we, we do have actually some specification documents, the Word documents, which we will give out freely where you can just copy and paste them into a specification. Oh, cool. And that would cover from the origin where you have a type one device, your subboards, and if necessary, you down to your uh, end equipment. And then we have a, um, a, a longer document which will also cover, say, other services like um, Cat5 cabling, Cat6, um, other control cables. So you can you know, have these absolutely free of charge and you can just go cut, paste into your document. That's absolutely no problem. So. Robin, whereabouts are these available from? Are they just Dane um, website? Uh, I don't know if we're on the Dane website, but just drop Dane a line and we can sort that out. That's not a problem. Okay. Um, it's probably worth also noting that you guys have uh, on your website a, what is, well, I suppose I call it the Red Book, but yeah. it's a lightning protection guide. It's 489 pages of just eye-watering, yep. everything you want to know uh, and from the German geniuses. <laughs> and it is not a big font either. No, <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> no, it's it is incredible detail. But the one thing I do like about it is I'm a massive fan of visual representation, because if you are going on a learning journey and developing your CPD, I, I've always said to people, the BISRA guides to building services are visual representations of how building services distribution should be done. Um, OK, yes, they're probably 10, 15 years old now. But if you have pictures, sometimes you can educate, you can narrate, you can talk, but you can debate. Yeah, but this this is this is an educational document. I mean, I've just flicked to one page on page 53. It's got illustrations there of Kikos Law. <laughs> you know, so, you know, great. Yeah, you know, it's not just it's not just product solution, product solution. It's the actual science. Oh, absolutely. You've got the yeah. science. If you've got the science, then, you know, guys just need to dive straight into that. It's better than what we get in BSM. Yeah, this, this covers foundation electrodes to a level that, I mean, they even show you pictures of how the connections to rebar are and, mm. and, and step potentials in 3D animated human people. And yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's off the, it's off the chart. It's a very good document. If I, if I may say it's, and the thing is, is for, uh, from a training <laughs> perspective, this is gold dust because mm. a trainer yeah. can go away and, and mine the data to to slowly draw out um, some of the logical solutions that, that people need to find. That's what trainers need to do. Guys who deliver the regs training need to develop, over develop their understanding so they can then actually properly translate these regulations. Because these are these guys are the bridge between the regulations and the electricians. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, they go we, they we go have, on the regs course and that's it. Yeah. Mm. I mean, we have so many uh, powerpoints in house. You know, I do a lot of training myself, a lot of seminars. And it, we, we do take uh, just a 7671 course to a very, very deep level. It, it can last all day. You know, mm -hmm. the dialogue and discussion and banter in the room of a group of people is, is such it lasts all day. I'm happy with that. It just shows that That's people the are best engaging. Way, isn't it? It's the best way. When you get a class where everybody's really going, uh, the, for me, the best training class is when people go, I'm not quite too sure. So let's keep talking. Let's keep working it from from varied angles and so that I can validate my understanding. So when I leave, I, I've got a good picture of what it is. And it's, it's, it's one of the things I hated in FE was lesson plans because lesson plans would go in this hour, then this and then this and then this. But if you have a group that want to chew on it, develop it, enhance it, you know, you don't want to shut it down. Yeah. No, no that's the worst. Well, that just it. becomes a toxic and boring classroom. Yeah. Um, I've I've been in three day courses where the guy's just gone. Uh, this keep, is going, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd love to talk to you about that. When in actual fact, what they're yeah. saying is, is I don't really know. No. <laughs> Let's just keep but going. That is a big problem, though. Race through. I mean, we we've spoken to other manufacturers, and they said to us, what they they observed an eighteenth edition update or a course, and the the trainer skipped the whole of four 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 and four four three because it wasn't in the exam was the wording mm. and i've heard that so many times because yeah. it's only because there's only a potential being maybe one question we don't need to spend time on that because it's all about an exam and that's exactly what's wrong with this yeah in fairness it wasn't yeah. you know, i did the three-day course and it wasn't covered and uh, the the lecturer openly it was i think it was two days after it actually came out the lecturer yeah. openly said he'd spent like six hours reading the 18th edition i'd spent six months reading the 18th edition dpc so when it came to the if changes did, on the third day yeah. the class actually turned around and said are you going to give us an update all the changes and he turned around and he went paul can you do it and i then spent half a day giving everybody an update because i was there <laughs> doing an evening talk but 
Yeah, but resource like this red book are great. But if I delivered yeah. a dedicated session on four four, I go here's some prior learning. Mm. Mm. Why why yeah. why go through the effort when I can give that and then I can refer to that and then transfer yeah. it to seven and six seven one. Mm. You know, Absol so, absolutely. I mean, uh, education is one of the real drivers behind Dane. Actually, you know, you go to Germany, they do these magnificent courses. We're opening up a, a new academy in the UK at the offices in um, Yorkshire. And it's to fill this gap in the knowledge that isn't really being filled by many other ways. It's, it's shocking. It really it's, need, it's, it's very much needed, Robin. It's very much needed because no one else is going to do this. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, sitting guilds, you know, training organizations, short courses. No yeah. time. No time. No. Shame. Big shame. Mm -hmm. um, which kind of leads me on to, well, not me. Um, <laughs> PV systems. I think John might have a question on this. Oh. I hope. Yeah, this um, obviously uh, photovoltaic panels or solar panels. Do you need surge protection on the DC side for a solar installation? Right. Now then, let's look at domestic first. Okay. I would always refer to the manufacturer's warranty because there's a lot of suppliers of inverters that say, um, if something uh, does damage your inverter, if there haven't been any DC um, SPDs installed, you may not be covered. Now, inverters do come with a level of protection. It's normally type two. So there is some built-in protection, no question about that. But when you get onto larger installations in the commercial environment, say it's a metal roof or it's all bonded to the LPS because um, yeah. we can't have a separation distance, at that point, the surge protection must be type, type one. one. It needs to go up, yeah. And it needs to go up a level and it's got to be mounted very close. It can be parallel wired uh, from the isolators, which you've really got to have for isolation on the DC side anyway. So it's not difficult to fit if it's commercial or a ground mounted system, I would say yes on the domestic. Just having metal on the roof doesn't make your house more attractive to lightning because it's such a small target anyway. Mm -hmm. So uh, absolutely look at the warranty for your inverter. And if it advises you to do so to cover the terms of the warranty, yes, I would fit it. Uh, if it's got type two in there, that's probably enough. But if there's anything to do with lightning protection on metal roofs, it's got to be a type one. Well, that answers that then. So um, thank you for validating I was right. Good. <laughs> <laughs> I had, um, and it's, there's, a, there's a story behind this. So I actually had a debate with a solar installer who will actually be coming on this podcast very soon. Mm -hmm. um, in the next few weeks, we'll be recording where um, I actually request, I, when we were installing uh, PV systems, we've probably installed about 250 kilowatts in the last four weeks across mm -hmm. various railway stations on roofs. And the very first one, I turned around to him and I said, well, you know, where's the DC surge protection? And honestly, the looks I got was like I'd slept with someone's sister. Um, it was it was shock and horror. And they were like, but we don't do it anywhere else. And I was like, but why not? Yeah. yeah. Why not? Given the magnitude of energy and the peaks and troughs and the rises and fall, why wouldn't you do that? Mm -hmm. You know, th this is one installation that's crying out for it. Um, and l long story short, we've got them on the DC side of the inverter. We've got, then got the inverter in the middle, and then we've got obviously isolation points on both sides and also AC yeah. uh, surge protection as well, um, which is good. And once the lads did a couple of them, they actually turned around and said, yeah, this is this is good. This is what we're going to do going forward everywhere. But it was just having that debate as to why you would do it mm. and the risks. And I think they've just been very complacent. They've been doing it for so many years. They hadn't stopped and considered it. And it did end up. It ended up being like a toolbox talk on site for an hour where we debated the merits of it and we ended up getting a rigs book out and started yeah. talking and but it was good so yeah we've 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 got them on 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 my railway on both sides and i think they're very valid but mm. now you've got we're worried about the maintenance and inspection and and all that good stuff so i need to i need to do a little bit more thinking on that so thank you for that no problem. <laughs> oh don't forget by the way if you've got um data coming from your inverters going to maybe a web connected box yes um, if it's um, a copper cable from the inverter to your, uh, I think it's, is it uh, Web Central or something that SMA do, um, we've recommended putting an SPD on that as well. Um, I've gone to several megawatt sites 
uh, field installations where lightnings hit the ground. They've had DCSPDs, but in every string combiner box, there's some data cables feeding back to a central uh, containerized um, control um, system. And every single monitoring block in every string combiner box was taken out because you've got a massive collection area in a, a field system. You've got masses and masses mm. of cables. So uh, don't forget your um, data. Um, right. We well. put that on the snag lists. Yes. <laughs> yeah, check that. Okay, good point. Very good point, actually. Um, well, Karen, talk about writing this down because it's important. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, a few little bits before we kind of wind it up. Um, the, I want to talk about the, f well, should we, should we talk about the elephant in the room to fuse or not to fuse? <laughs> so we discussed um, with Kirsty uh, in one of the last podcasts. I can't remember which one it was. But we did we did a two part about the need for overcurrent protection of the device because there are um, there are weirdly enough. I, okay, so I've just bought a three hundred and fifty pounds worth of um, which has broken my heart of a brand new consumer unit for my house type A RCBOs, brand new metal enclosure main switch, and a twin orange surge protection uh, unit um which is great and i thought was wonderful and then obviously we had kirsty on a podcast and we looked into the regulations a bit more and then we then realized actually i have opened up and on the orange little device it has a icon of a fuse and says 125 amps and i'm now relying on my overcurrent protective device of the dno fuse which is outside of the scope of bs 7671 so what's your view on to fuse or not to fuse? You don't. You don't? Why would you? If, if we look at, say, the, the service fuse, um, is it, it's BS88, isn't it? Uh, your 1361 Type 2B, yep. yeah. But... What's its rupture capacity? When's it going to blow? How many KA? Oh, uh, I think it's, it's 16 or 33, 16 isn't it? 16 or 33. Yes. <laughs> Still now, remember it. In, in the regs, the minimum value for your Type 2 is 5KA. Yes. And a Dane device is typically 20 or 40KA. Okay. But the thing is, is the surge device itself, when it goes into <coughs> fault mode, i.e. it's about to fail, is open circuit. Because you have the um, MOV in there, you have this soldered connection, and um, when it goes into thermal runaway because it's faulty and it's about to go into a short circuit, it's that little soldered connection that breaks, changes the indicator from green to red, and shuts the SPD down. You only have to worry about um, having um, overcurrent protective devices in a Type 2 circuit if you've got a pretty big installation, say 250 amps or more. Now, air devices are rated at 125 amp, so in every domestic installation, it is absolutely okay to take the live and neutral into the top of the SPD from the top of the isolator or Henley blocks or whatever. You do not need to have any overcurrent protective device. It is not required. The manufacturer's instructions are you only need it over 125 amps, then so be it. That's what it's been tested to. They're designed to fail as open circuit. And I um, have not yet seen an installation where a SPD has gone down and taken out the service fuse. Okay, um, I'm, hang on a second. I'm just trying to, I'm desperately trying to go through my marked up regs book, which is failing me miserably. But I'm pretty sure there is somewhere in here. John, can you remember what one it is? Or one of you two chaps? I'm pretty sure there is a regulation in here somewhere that talks about the need for overcurrent protection there was one that said about uh, to verify or to achieve cont um, if there was a risk of continuity of service or something. Yeah, that was it, wasn't it? Continu and how you define continuity of service? I think that was the, the discussion. Yeah. So, so run us through this again, Robert, just briefly. So you would only apply it if the system was two fifty amp or more, because your devices are rated up to one twenty five. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. well, it, well, because they're rated at 125 amps, I would use them on boards larger than that. Because right. I, 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 what, what it, say I've got a, a small factory where I've got a 200 amp incomer. Okay. I would want the local SPD fuse, which is rated at, say, 125 amps, to blow 
not the 200 amp main income. Gotcha. Right. So on larger installations, I would want that sort of selectivity in the surge circuit. In a, a consume unit where you've got like um, just a few tens of millimeters from the live and neutral to the top of the SPD, I'm not worried about something really happening to those cables. And then I've got a short um, PE connection to the chassis because that's the best thing to do. So within the confines of a metal consume unit, all I'm really worried about is the behavior of the SPD to produce a short circuit. But when they blow, they fail open circuit. That's the whole point of the soldered connection. So I'm breaking the circuit. It's a fail safe sort of design. Um, so I wouldn't worry too much about having an additional um, MCB because you're just having more cables, you're having longer lengths, you've got the volt drop within the actual um, device itself, you can turn the MCB off, it's actually introducing more problems than solving it an imaginary problem. Okay. You've I can't find this rig. I am still looking for the reg, although my, my, my eyesight's going or I'm just losing the will to live with this damn book. It keeps getting bigger and bigger. Uh, I mean, we, we, we do also make an SPD, a little type two, which is rated at 63 amps. Now that's a bit tight. So if I've got an 80 amp head or mm. 100 amp head, I would need to have a 63 amp breaker if the consumer unit manufacturer makes it um, to feed that little SPD because clearly it's it's not got the same sort of uh, performance as the dearer one. So certain SPDs may require them, but if you look at the manufacturer's instructions, it's rated 125 amps, the domestic installation does not need an MCB in that search circuit, not necessary. Oh dear. I'm struggling to find this reg number. This is just... Uh... <laughs> He's on a journey. Yeah, John. Come off it. You're you're better at this than I am. What am I talking about? Dave, you're an encyclopedia of this damn book. Yeah, I'm getting up. Hang on, I'll get my book. Sorry, I just want to debate this because I think it's quite important. Because what we've got is is there's there's different schools of thought, and I just wanna I wanna be able to see both sides of the argument because what you've said is 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 valid and it's logical. Yeah. Um but I also see so, for instance, if I use my, um, while the lads are checking their books, um, if I use my railway, for example, continuity service is essential, and every surge protection device I've ever seen on a railway always has an overcurrent protection device mm -hmm. on it, everywhere. They all do, um, other than the Type 3 stuff. It's it's Type 1s, Type 2s have got some form of uh, overcurrent protection device. Um, I suppose it's just how you go, yeah. It's but weird. In, it's weird. In your installations, I mean, yes. are you talking about something which is going to be greater than, say, 80 amps? Oh, God, yeah. So oh, that, yeah, that yeah, makes yeah. perfect sense. In, in your yeah, installations, absolutely, absolutely, every installation like that, I would see an overcurrent protective device in the surge circuit. Because right. if, in the remote possibility, my SPD fails as a short, you are going to want a local SPD fuse to pop not yep. your 6,000 amps, because the loss of your um, service is intolerable. Yeah, but no, in a domestic dwelling, um, where the value of the uh, SPD, its performance is greater than the incoming fuse, my SPD is designed to file open circuit. Yeah, no, I suppose there is a difference between a railway station and an Xbox. Yeah, so, um. so, so you know, absolutely, <laughs> in your installations, I would always fit the overcurrent protection. In the domestic install, a lot of the um, consuming it manufacturers are just parallel wiring off the, the, the main income. There's no problem with that. Yeah. Some manufacturers have to have an SPD because the performance of the components within the SPD requires that. Ah. It's down to the manufacturer's guidance, really. As a manufacturer for their Type Two devices, generally speaking, so, you don't need you don't need it in a domestic industry. So here's one. Here's one, so I've got the reg number here. Finally, found it. Regulation five three four. Yeah, four dot five dot one. Quicker than you, mate. Sorry, mate. Well, I was talking. I was buying you time. Um, it says um, it says it's general protection of the SPD against overcurrent. SPD installations shall be protected against overcurrent with respect to short circuit currents. But then again, the next line. 
and this is a valid point um, for, for, for Robin's um, debate, this protection may be internal and or external to the SPD according to manufacturer's instruction. Yes, that's the important bit because we all make mm. slightly different components and mm. we make SPDs with fuses built into them. So the argument about what fuse do I want has disappeared. We've already designed it and made the decision for you. We have them without fusing and we'll tell you what fusing you need in given circumstances. Every SPD comes with a data sheet. So hopefully when they open the box, they don't throw the box away with the instruction sheet with it. So if my installation is 125 amps or less, my type twos don't need that additional thing. Now, now people will fit them because bizarrely, it's easier to fit the SPD in certain installations if you can come off the buzz bar through a breaker. I, I get that. It makes it easier. But you're introducing longer cables and the volt drop across the actual MCB itself. So to have the best performance, you have the shortest cables. And if the manufacturer instructions permits it, do away with that uh, OCPD2, which is not normally required. But it's got to be driven by the manufacturer's instructions. <sighs> Bombshell. Bombshell. There you go. Is, is there a place, um, I'm going through the red book quickly, but is there, a, do Dane have like literature that gives all those different circumstances with the product? So, you know, if it's got internal protection or if you require the need for additional overcurrent protection, is all of that in some kind of layman's idiot book? Um, uh, every product we do has a data sheet on the website. You mm -hmm. click on that, it'll tell you whether it's got a built-in fuse or not. And if it hasn't got a built-in fuse, it'll tell you what fuse you will need. Right. Okay. What, what is just for everyone listening, the website, is it dane.co.uk? It is, yes. Right. I think there's a lot of people listening to this will be jumping onto the Dane website, although there's probably one or two people that won't need to because they've probably got it faved into their, saved into their <laughs> favourites already. I know a few few guys um, who are avid um, uh, Dane fans, which is which is good. They speak very highly and I can see why. So in summary, then, you guys are investing in training, in knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know about you guys, but I've learned loads here because I think – I think surge protection is a good and logical step forward. Um, I think it then it also I think there's more of a debate to be had into whole. Um, and we, we did a we did a webinar earlier on with Dave where I spoke about the more modern the technology. Well, modern the technology is not a modern technology, but the more devices that we have that are interacting, we need to ensure that we are correctly selecting and erecting for every circumstance. And that's where I think there isn't necessarily maybe a common rule. There may be a, if it, if this is the installation and you followed the regs, this is what you would need to do, but you now need to understand the fundamental principles of the manufacturers and how they apply the installation of their devices. And I think that's really, really important. Um, we're kind of at the hour. Um, I'm blown away. My brain's melted. Um, John Moore, David Boy, have you got any other questions for um, Robin? Or are you just in stunned silence? <laughs> yeah, I think that's covered uh, most of the points we wanted to uh, cover on that. So, uh, yeah, and there's a lot of uh, very useful information from that. I'm I'm going to be checking out this academy. You say it's going to open soon. Yeah, um, we were... 80% of the way there when the government said we can't have <coughs> contractors in the building anymore. So as, oh, right. soon as, as soon as this is over, it won't take long to get it online. But people can certainly express interest, register their interest mm -hmm. with the company anyway, because we will be running courses. Uh, we've got a full massive demo area, surge protection, lightning protection and earthing. So it's a big investment for us. Do you have uh, maybe an existing thing set up? I mean, <coughs> this, this book is quite big as it is. Uh, the guys at home with some free time can go and get some learning and resource from you? Um, there are some other documents, I think, on our downloads page or documentation page. So we, we yeah. have like white papers for specific applications. Mm. Um, so there's a lot of info there. But again, if, if people want to get in touch with the office via email or phone, um, they may come to me, they may not. It doesn't matter. There's other technical people. So um whatever the question is we're, we're happy to to answer that one yeah no i i'm really looking forward to kind of seeing the academy and i think i i think you know it's up to guys like yourselves to try to educate electricians and then mm -hmm. well educate trainers to then educate electricians or help or something and 
In all fairness, I think the one thing that I've learned from these three podcasts we've done now on surge protection is is I need to go on <laughs> some further 62305 education and surge protection selection. I, I definitely think there is uh, uh, some merit for a, a one or two day selection and erection mm. course for electricians that you could you could almost develop a week long course where you could do two days is your industrial agricultural. Um, one day could be your domestic installation and your other two days could be very bespoke specialist solar wind turbine. Oh, yeah, we've got that. Yeah. Yes, you know, special occasions type stuff, but you could you could almost build up a portfolio of ongoing competence in surge. And I think that's almost what's needed, because I think the one thing I've learned from these uh, these chats is the fundamental principles of what surge does. Everybody can agree on, but the correct selection and erection of surge protection is one that requires continuous and ongoing development of knowledge competence and understanding of the use of the installations mm. as well mm. and the next cards of design yeah, yeah and to um and just to add from me i mean as i said in the previous podcast obviously we were talking a lot about lightning yeah uh, and as we said earlier on obviously we we, we try to because we have a separate stand and we try to keep 7671 over there and lightning over there you know obviously we have other sources of over voltage than lightning we obviously have storms where you have Obviously, failure of equipment, um, and well, the IEC finding great. That. Yeah, we need to find. I have the same issue with the arc flash industry, where we look at just HV arc flash instead of LV arc flash. We need to try to look at, you know, of illustrating over voltage to electricians, not as a lightning strike, because then they will inquire and they'll go, "Oh no, that's a different thing." Mm. We need to we need to, we need to illustrate to them the way that really engages. We did that little post on fa on my Facebook group, didn't we, Paul? anybody had incidences and you know there's there's so many guys who actually gave examples where equipment had failed yeah uh, you know it, it doesn't have to take a dramatic lightning strike and again it's it's just education education is oh, really and, key here. and and one of the the biggest beefs that we have is um hazardous area mm -hmm. where if there is a lightning strike within an atex zone you're guaranteed an explosion oh gosh yeah um, mm. What is the one thing that um, this, a certain course provider of hazardous area training material doesn't cover? It's <laughs> exactly the thing which is guaranteed to make it go bang. That's yeah. lightning and over voltage. Yeah, that's, that's not true. covered. They will do all the glanding of boxes, junction boxes, all the rest of it, flame proof light fittings, etc. But lightning protection? No, don't do that. Yeah, in all fairness, I mean, I'm going to say it, I've said it before, um, lightning protection industry, I think, from the days of is it 6651, um, and then when it went to BSEN 62305, it went from this thing you could possibly understand with a bit of applied effort to a, a dark art of illusion and mystery. It was almost like going to Hogwarts and doing an advanced diploma yeah. in invisible stuff that you can't see or predict. Um and now surge protection is involved. I mean, I, I can tell you now I've spoken to people where I've mentioned lightning protection, and surge protection, and the responses from senior board level people has been it's a load of old rubbish. It's all made up. It's just a, a money making scam um, because it sits there and it costs us money and it doesn't actually do anything until and, you and, want it to until you want it to. Absolutely. And trust me, I am a I am a convert on surge. Dave and John know exactly why. Um, it's a it's a bit of a headache for me on the railways because we have lots and lots of transients and lots of switching oh, yeah. surges and spikes and yeah even the railways don't always get it right um, but um, Robin thank you very much for educating us oh, um, thank it's you. been insightful um, John Dave any last questions before we wrap this up no I feel like I have to go away and revise now <laughs> I actually <laughs> thank you very like much I need yeah. to go away and read the red book so yeah. yeah no thank you very much John anything. No, I think that's it. I think it's just another example of that electricians' lives are just going to get a lot more complicated and there's a lot more stuff to actually uh, think about and get involved with. Yeah. Sorry, that was my front door. There's someone knocking on my door at this time of night. Um, anyway, gang, um, thank you very much. Robin, thank you very much. Anyone no, needs to get in touch with them, it's dane.co.uk. Robin, yep. oh, you're on LinkedIn and various other social media platforms, I'm assuming. Oh, I'm sure, yes, yes. Uh, or any um, of the team at the Dane. Dane certainly is, yes. Yeah. Any of the team at Dane, please feel free to get in touch with them. They're a jolly bunch. Um, and that's it. Thank you very much for listening. Mm, um, please find us on social media, like it, and all that good stuff. And until the next one, gents, thank you very much. And Robin, thank you again. Bye-bye. Take thank care you. of yourself and each other. Bye-bye. Thank you. Cheers, then. All right.